Washington Times every morning, as I think every intelligent person should, and there uh, is on the top of the front page an article headlining Conyers Weighing Probe of Acorn. First paragraph, opponents of the liberal activist group ACORN have found an unlikely champion in House Judiciary Committee Chairman John Conyers Jr., who is clashing with his own party to pursue hearings on accusations that the group has committed crimes ranging from voter fraud to a mob-style protection racket. I was stunned by this, and then I remembered it's April Fool's Day. <laughs> in 2009, the Leadership Institute has already trained 1,296 students in 34 of our schools, of which there are 44 types. And since 1979, the Institute has trained more than 71,500 people, most of them students. You have before you uh, at your table uh, our, our current 2009 school schedule. We add new schools uh, uh, throughout the year, but I urge you to take a moment to review uh, these upcoming schools and consider attending one or sending a friend uh, to, to one of our programs. Um, now my pleasure to introduce Alexander Knight, who will offer an invocation and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Alexander Knight currently served, serves as a campus services coordinator at our campus leadership program here at the Leadership Institute. He also manages the speaker grant program that LI offers to its campus leadership program groups. Prior to his involvement at the Leadership Institute, Alex was vice president of the College Republicans at Christendom College, where he received a bachelor's degree in political science and economics. Alex? Thank you, Morton. Now let us bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we come to you to ask for your blessing and help us as we gather here together. We pray for guidance in the matters at hand and ask that you would show us how to conduct our work with a spirit of joy and enthusiasm. Give us the desire to find ways to excel in our work. Help us to work together and encourage each other to excellence. We ask that we would challenge each other to reach higher and farther to bring the most glory to you. We also ask that you may guide those in power so that they may lead the people to their proper end, eternal life with you. We ask this all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Alex. And now it is my pleasure to uh, introduce Miguel Moreno, whom uh, I encountered uh, there so ago uh, at National Airport. I was coming back from the Philadelphia Society meeting in, uh, in New Orleans, and Miguel was coming back from our uh, International School of Fundraising in, in England. Um, Miguel has 15 years of experience organizing international seminars. Um, he has trained key leaders from Africa, Australia, Asia, Europe, Latin America, and the Middle East. He has worked with and trained for the U.S. Agency for International Development, the Inter-American Development Bank, the World Bank, the University of California, and National American uh, University. Uh, we are now uh, honored to have him as our Director of International Programs. Come make a report. Thank you, Morton. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I'm uh, the Director of International Programs at the Leadership Institute. And um, this uh, department was created by Morton Blackwell in 2006 
with the same mission that the Leadership Institute has of uh, r identifying, recruiting, training, and placing the next generation of conservative leaders in the public pro policy process and the media around the world. We offer great training for uh, leaders that are uh, pro-family, pro-life, pro-freedom, free enterprise, and traditional values around the world. We have uh, three different kinds of uh, international schools. Uh, we have some that are undertaken here in Arlington, Virginia, and we call our international leadership training schools. We bring 30 to 50 very prominent lecturers, and um, we have attendees coming from several, several countries around the world, sometimes from 50 to more than 100. They come sometimes even for, uh, from more than 30 countries around the world. And uh, we have also our over overseas international schools, and um, we have undertaken several schools around the world. And our international school of fundraising that uh, we have started last year in March 2008, and this year also March 2009, in uh, Crowthorne, Berkshire, United Kingdom. I'm going to be um, mentioning a little bit more about our, our International School of Fundraising that uh, takes place at Wellington College. What we do is um, we concentrate on fundraising and we teach, for example, why people give to you personal solicitation, organizing successful events, current trends in fundraising, how direct mail works. We have more than 30 lectures that in a very interesting seminar. And we have among our speakers, Morton Blackwell, Bruce Everly, Stephen Klaus, Jose Antonio Ureta that comes from France, Slamovir Olejniak from Poland, Kevin Gentry, and uh, Matthias von Gersdorf and all of these speakers from the United States, Latin America, and Europe. Fourteen speakers came last week to the United Kingdom to teach different subjects on fundraising. Among the students we train, the delegates, we have heads on, of nonprofit organizations, we had several members of parliament, we had uh, academic leaders, political consultants, and um, the training is great, but also great is the opportunity to do networking and meet some other people that are following the same causes in their own countries. We have uh, students coming from all over the world and also speakers that come from different countries around the world. In some countries, uh, we have leaders that are modeling the Leadership Institute in their own country. We have trained uh, more than 5,000 international students, and some of the students we have trained, they have become deputies, members of parliament. In the case of uh, Dario Paya, Ruben Reyes, Michael Sherva, that came to receive training here, now is, he's a councilman in the government of Poland. And we have several people that came here, and they got very motivated. They went back to their countries, and they won elections, or they started nonprofit organizations. Our international students that come here, some of them become donors because they go back to their countries and they start doing fundraising to organize international events. And we have the case, for example, of training the son of the president of Tanzania, a very bright lawyer who had a master's degree in the London School of Economics. He went back to Tanzania and uh, he spoke with his father, the president, and they brought together 50 of the most prominent leaders in Dar es Salaam, and three speakers went to, from the Leadership Institute went to um, Dar es Salaam to do training with them, and they were very motivated. Same thing we did in Nicaragua, in Austria, the UK, Canada, and several other countries uh, around the world. This is... Um, a picture of our students last week at our International School of Fundraising in the United Kingdom. We had um, several students representing more than 20 countries around the world. 
and this takes place at the Wellington College in Crowthorne. It's a really, as you can see in the pictures, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. And uh, we have, even though we are in an economic crisis, we have a large group of more than 80 attendees um, that they have chosen the Leadership Institute one more time to win and to do fundraising. And we did a survey last year uh, for the school last year, and um, all of the, the students that reply and uh, they filled out the, the survey, they said that they are fundraising for the first time in their organizations, and some of them are fundraising 10 times more than what they did before. And a student from Mongolia said, I never knew that the fundraising event will uh, be successful in Mongolia. But we did an event and we raised the first night $50,000. So it's really great the impact that we have with our international schools. Some students are encouraged to do fundraising for their organizations for the first time. Some others, they want to launch new programs, new organizations. And after this um, very intensive training, three-day training, we do a tour to London City so that they will visit all the different monuments and buildings. We have partners around the world. Some of the most important partners we have are the World Congress of, of Families, Atlas, Economic Research Foundation, Heritage Foundation, Cato, uh, Family Tradition and Property, CFAM, and Human Life International. And um, we always tell in our international schools the experience that our president, Morton Blackwell, had in 1980 as a director of youth for Reagan, and 1981 to 1983 as a special assistant to President Reagan. And they get very motivated to know that our president has fought with Reagan and other leaders around the world for freedom, for democracy, and for the values we stand for. We have uh, 44 schools at the Leadership Institute, and we offer these schools also internationally. We also tell them about our in international internships, where we receive international interns for three months to get an experience here in Washington, D.C., and also to do some very good networking while there they also have a very good work experience. <coughs> um, our international students, they choose if they are going to come here to Arlington, Virginia, or they are going to do an international school in their countries, or if they are going to attend the school in the United Kingdom. Some of them do the third, all, all these three things, and they come over and over and again to our international schools. And we have several reports from students where they think Morton Blackwell, our donors, our speakers, our staff, the Leadership Institute for organizing amazing conferences, life-changing events, inspiring programs, in this case of the International School of Fundraising at Wellington College, which is a great venue, and they have uh, comfortable accommodations and very enjoyable meals. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Miguel. Um, it is now my pleasure to, uh, to introduce the person who will introduce our distinguished speaker. Uh, Rachel Phillips is a communications training coordinator at the Leadership Institute, and before coming here, she interned at the Council for National Policy. Rachel is from Ohio and she graduated from Hillsdale College in May of last year with a bachelor's degree in marketing management. Rachel? Thank you. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Jim Jordan this morning. Um, he was raised in Champaign County, Ohio, graduating from Graham High School in 1982, where he was a four-time state champion in wrestling with a career record of 150 and one. 
He went on to earn a bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Wisconsin, where he was a two-time NCAA wrestling champion. He later earned a master's degree in education from The Ohio State University and a law degree from Capital University in Columbus, Ohio. In Congress, Jordan has emerged as a prominent defender of the taxpayer's pocketbook through his work on spending issues. He continues to support making the 2001 and 2003 tax cuts permanent and has offered a series of budget and appropriations amendments aimed at stemming the excessive growth of government spending. He serves on the House Judiciary Committee, the House Budget Committee, and the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Jim and his wife Polly are the parents of four children. The Jordan family lives near Urbana and attends Grace Bible Church. Please welcome Jim Jordan. Thank you. <coughs> Don't. Don't, uh, don't clap, you haven't heard me talk yet, but uh, Rachel, thank you. You could sum that all up, you know. Washed up jock politician lawyer, it's not much to brag about. Uh, actually, I'm not a lawyer, I have a law degree, never did take the bar exam, so I, you, don't hold that, don't, you can't hold that against me, but it's good to, uh, good to be with you this morning. It's, uh, this is a place that I uh, actually have received some training from, so it has a fond, fond place in our heart, and we appreciate the... Um, the work of Morton in this place, the Leadership Institute, the your, your and Helen's commitment to freedom and conservative principles. I mean, it, it, that is what we need, and uh, we certainly appreciate that. Appreciate all your support of uh, the Leadership Institute and, and the good work that goes on, um, goes on here. Um, let me just start with a couple questions. How many of you are like me and believe that we live in the greatest nation in history? The United States of America done more for freedom, more to help folks around this world than any other country. Now, how many of you are just a little bit nervous about the direction that America's heading right now? <laughs> Put your hand up. I mean, I, I do this. I mean, it's the truth. And I am too. I'm 45 years old. First time in my life, first time in my life where I've been somewhat anxious about uh, where we're heading. And frankly, all you got to do is look at the last two weeks. If, you wanna, if, you, if you're concerned about something, who would have thought that we would see a time where the President of the United States can decide who's the CEO of a company in this country? I mean, who would have thought that? And I understand GM stuck its hand out, invited, invited the heavy hand of government, but still, unprecedented measure we saw this week where the President of the United States decides who's going to be, I thought that was a decision for the stockholders and the board to decide who's going to run the companies in this country. And then, of course, two weeks ago, you saw your Congress uh, was, you know, sticking their finger in the wind and thinking they had to do something as crazy as put a 90% tax on the, again, AIG invited this when they took the money. But the actions of the Congress saying we're going to, I mean, frankly, I thought the, uh, the, the tack that the Congress took, I voted against it, the tack that the Congress took was, if it was so bad, go get 100% of the money. Don't, 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 don't levy a 90% tax on the bonuses that the, the, the folks from AIG. So I think it's appropriate that we are a little nervous. And frankly, the good news is the American people are getting it. I, I was telling someone earlier, um, three weeks ago, on the first nice spring day in Ohio, Sunday afternoon, sunny Sunday afternoon when families could be spending time with their family, 5,000 people showed up in Fountain Square, downtown Cincinnati, at one of these taxpayer tea parties to say, stop the insanity in Washington. Start behaving like you're supposed to behave. Start representing us, the people. And so it was good to see that uh, the people are starting to get it. Hopefully the politicians will. But I'm, I'm, I'm a little skeptical of that. And I just want to uh, talk real quickly about a few things that are going on right now and why I believe you're actually, seeing, uh, you're actually seeing what I've called an attack on the values we cherish and an attack on the liberties and freedoms that we also cherish. And, and just think about two things that have happened on the value side. Two things that happened with the new administration. The Mexico City policy issue and the stem cell issue when we think about protecting the sanctity of human life, what the, what the president has done. Totally wrong. Totally wrong what he's done with the executive orders. And now think about what the administration and the Congress are going to try to do in the next eight weeks. Six things. I've t I told a group Monday back in our, in our district in Ohio, to do any one of these at any time is a bad idea. To do any one of them during a recession is a worse idea. To attempt all six during a recession is plain crazy. But that's exactly what your Congress, your government is going to try to do in the next eight weeks. Think about it. It starts this week with the budget. I'm on the budget committee. Um, had a vote on the budget bill last week in the committee, and, and uh, this budget's unbelievable. Uh, it's going to be on the floor. Well, we'll be debating it tonight. We'll be on the floor for a vote tomorrow. I'm actually sponsoring an alternative budget as a member of, as the budget task force chairman of the Republican Study Committee. A budget we're going to offer is actually going to balance um, 
something you, you would think that government should, should, should do. You know, families and taxpayers and business owners have to do that. But think what they're going to do, and it starts with this budget. Over the next, um, the next eight weeks, the attacks on freedom. First with the budget, tax increases. Anytime you raise taxes, you are diminishing the freedom of current Americans, taking more of our money, depriving us of the opportunity to use that money on our goals, our dreams, the things that have real meaning, real significance to ourselves, our families, to our small business. So largest tax increase in history coming in this budget. Continuation of unprecedented spending. I mean, it, it is... It is out of control. And you've heard all the stories. What, what the Obama administration and the, and the Obama and Democrat budget will do in the next six years to the national debt, they will add more, more to the national debt in the next six years than the previous 43 presidents did combined. Now think about that. From George to George is how I like to say it. From Washington to Bush, we didn't pile up as much debt as our government's going to pile up in the next six years. The 10 largest deficits are the next 10 years. I mean, this is a, an attack on future generations' freedom, our kids and our grandkids, because when you borrow that much, when you spend that much, and, and understand this too, we always hear about tax and spend politicians, it's actually the opposite. It's spend and tax. Spending always drives the equation. You have to attack the spending. When you spend as much as government likes to spend, particularly the federal government, you have to tax and you have to borrow. And when you do that, you mortgage the future of our kids and our grandkids, you harm the, the liberties and freedoms of future generations of Americans. Terrible, terrible direction we're headed with this, this out of control spending. Card check issue. Not in the budget, but been talked about. I'm sure many of you have heard, have you heard about this issue? Direct assault on employees' workers' freedoms. When you deny them the right to the secret ballot, something we cherish in this country. Something, I mean, it, this, this is not only bad economic policy, it just, it just fundamentally wrong when you're going to deny someone the right to a secret ballot, which is how current labor law works. Uh, Group of, group of workers want to form a labor union. God bless them, it's America, you can do that. But you should, you should have the ability to do that via a secret ballot. Further nationalization of health care. Money set aside in reserve fund in the budget to move towards a national board. Think about this. I, I, I say this back home all the time. I asked the question to, to the audience. I said, with the exception of the military, name one thing the federal government does well. And that's the reaction. People kind of chuckle and shake their head. And they actually start thinking. And it's amazing. You know, no one can think of really anything. I mean, you could probably think of some programs that actually make some sense and do some good, but not right off the top of your head. It takes a while. So we know instinctively that the that government, and in particular the federal government, is not the entity we want making decisions, particularly decisions as important as the, as the health care and the health care treatment we and our families are going to get. And yet, the national, you know the board, you know what the, the acronym for the board in uh, Great Britain is? It, 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 and I, I can't even remember the name, but the acronym is NICE. The NICE board. Think about that. What such irony. The NICE board is deciding what kind of health care you're going to get. There's actually a case in Great Britain where a 57-year-old gentleman wanted a hip replacement. And the board said, no, no, you're, you're just over, you're just too old. You're not going to, you know, 57, you're too old for a hip replacement. We do not want that in America. We certainly don't want that in America. And yet that's the direction this budget moves. Fifth, probably the most scary, in my opinion, is the cap and trade concept. Um, the idea that we're going to restrict the liberties and freedoms now of entrepreneurs and small business owners in our economy saying we're going to limit the amount of energy you can get. And we're going to, again, set up this national board that's going to determine the cap, the level, and then trade these credits, hand, sell these credits, and these credits will be traded in some kind of, like, some kind of commodity out there. Um, no one knows exactly how this system is going to work. All we do know is from experience when the federal government starts to do something like this, it's probably going to be bad. And I would say this, the potential for Abuse, potential for corruption, I think, is very real. When you have something this valuable, the ability to get the energy you need to use in your business, particularly if you're in manufacturing, like a state like Ohio, where manufacturing is huge, it's, it's scary. Because we all know that the big companies are going to get in line first, and it's, and, it's the, and it's the entrepreneur, those mid-sized and small-sized companies that actually make our economy go, that employ 70% of the people in this country, they're the ones who are going to get shortchanged, I believe, in this process. It's disproportionately... Um, uh, disproportionately hurts states like the one I get to represent, Ohio. I mean, we are a big manufacturing state. We're a coal-powered state. Most of the Midwest, in fact, will be disproportionately hurt because so much of our power comes from coal-fired plants. And um, we've all heard the term from the from the Cold War days: unilateral disarmament. Our emerging competitors in the international marketplace, China and India, aren't going to place limits on their energy, and yet we will. I mean, if we pass the law, we'll actually follow the law, unlike Europe, where they have these these guidelines and they don't follow them. We would actually do it. So it, it is a terrible concept in my judgment. 
And yet Henry Waxman is planning on introducing the bill. It may have been, been introduced even yesterday. It was supposed to be introduced this week. I have to, have to check. And it's talked about getting something done before uh, Memorial Day. We'll see. But scary, scary concept. And then finally, the sixth thing is protectionist policies. Uh, you know, trade is opportunity, opportunity to sell and market your product all, uh, to, to, to customers who want to, uh, who want to purchase that product. And when you place those kind of limits on, on the marketplace, again, it's a restriction on freedom. So all those things are happening now. I mean, and, and so when I say there is an attack on liberty, an attack on freedom, I don't think that's, I don't think that's just alarmist talk. I think that's the truth. And it's important we recognize that. And frankly, as a, as a Republican, and I, my, my background for, for some of you, like Rachel, have been in Ohio, uh, I'm critical of my party. I used to fight our governor in Ohio more than the Democrats did, uh, Governor Taft, when I thought he was doing crazy things like raising taxes and spending like crazy. So I'll be the first to criticize our party when we're wrong. But one of the things I think we need to do now as, as a party is, is articulate an alternative and, and what makes sense <clears throat> for the direction of this country. And we were talking here earlier, um, you know, we can't win any, any votes right now on, on the floor of the House of Representatives, just in the nature of the House. You know, in the House, the majority runs a place. In the Senate, the minority runs a place. Sort of, I mean, that's an overstatement. But with the 40-vote filibuster concept, the minority has real power in the Senate. In the House, it's, it's totally Nancy Pelosi and the majority run the place. So it, it is really tough for us to win uh, uh, votes there. So we're in the debate business. We're in the communications business. Margaret Thatcher had a great line. She said, you win the debate before you win the vote. And you know, the vote we care about, frankly, is the vote in November of 2010. But between now and then, it's our job as members of the Republican Party, the minority party, the conservative party, to engage the American people in a discussion about where, where we want to go as a nation, why these policies are wrong and why our policies make sense for preserving freedom and raising the standard of living in America. Something that, is, that has always happened. You think about what we're doing on spending. One of the things that makes America great is, is this idea that parents make sacrifices so their kids can have life a little better than they did. And then they in turn do the same thing for their children. And then they in turn do the same thing for them. And it's been that generational, that has, has raised the standard of living in America to where we're a $14 trillion economy, the greatest nation in history, both from an economic standard and from a freedom standard. And we've got to articulate a vision where we can maintain that that process as we go forward. And I think it's really basic. Keep taxes low, get spending under control, and have a common sense energy, when we're, when we're talking an economic framework here, and have a common sense energy policy where we say we're gonna use the natural resources we have and, and of course, look for those alternatives that make sense, develop those alternatives. That helps us not only in an economic security standpoint, but also from a, um, from a national security standpoint. That's the kind of vision we have to articulate out there. Our party is really about, when you stop and think about it, the modern Republican Party, the party of Ronald Reagan, the party that Morton was helping back in those early days when you looked just a little bit younger, not much, a little bit younger, uh, those youth for Reagan back in the early 80s, uh, really about four principles. Strong national defense, lower taxes, controlling spending, and defending traditional values, those principles that make us great in the first place. Those are the things we have to continue to articulate. When we do that, we always connect with the American people and we always win. When we shy away from those four principles, it's when we lose. It's my judgment why we lost in 2006. Frankly, we just spent too much money. We were great. I mean, you think about President Bush and God bless him. He, he did a lot of things, I think, right. He understood the tax policy. He was as solid as could be there. He definitely understood the terrorist threat. He was great on defending those, those values, life, family, uh, you know, marriage, those, those, those key fundamental principles and values. But when it came to spending, he was wrong, just plain wrong. And the, and, and the voters said, you know what? We, 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 if, if, for our voters, it's not good enough to be, to be solid on three of the four or two of the four. Our voters are principled people. The American people are principled people. They want us to be rock solid on all four. And when we, when we got away from the spending thing, we paid for it in election, uh, in the election of 2006. And so it's important we do that. Let me just real quickly give you a, kind of a framework for evaluating um, where we're at now, what you're seeing your, the, the government attempt to do, and then I'll, uh, I'll close and open up for, uh, for questions. But I think it's important to understand we face three big challenges as a nation today. Uh, I said this when I first ran for Congress back in 06, and, and I think it's every bit as true today. Three big challenges we face, and it's important we recognize these and then again articulate how we're gonna, how we're gonna handle them, how we're gonna confront them, and I'm confident we will. 
You know, one thing again, you all raise your hand because you just like me believe this is the greatest country ever. And one of the hallmarks of this nation is whatever the obstacle, whatever the hurdle, whatever, whatever's in front of us, we always figure out a way to deal with it. We always figure out a way to overcome it. It's just part of being an American. But three big challenges we face. The first is the terrorist threat. And trust me, this is as real as it gets. I always tell folks, just a country boy from Western Ohio, and when I, we first got elected, first took office, January of 2007, one of the things they do is they, they, they take all the new guys, new members to the House, new members to the Senate, take you to the Pentagon, they give you a briefing. The first part of the briefing is just general stuff, stuff you need to know, you, um, you, you learn about, you meet the liaison from the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, things that a congressional office needs to know, how you're going to deal with. If you've got a family who's got a son or daughter serving and some things, that you, basic stuff, good, good basic stuff you need to know. Second part of the briefing is they say, okay, we're going to take you down to another room. You go down to the other room, and they take your Blackberry, your cell phone, you walk in. They close the door, and it's this big room, biggest map of the world I've ever seen. And they actually flash the word secret on the screen. And you can't talk about what they tell you in there. But part of it, part of it is just the intimidating, you know, here I am, a country boy from Ohio, sitting in this room at the Pentagon, and they're talking about what the world looks like. And it's serious. And it's important we remember that. When, when, when we're thinking about the kind of policies we're going to, it's important to remember there are people out there who do not like what we stand for and who want to do us harm. And we have got to understand that as we move forward uh, as a nation. Second big threat, and it's what I've talked about already, is the economic challenge we face. I mean, it is real too. The emerging competitors in the international marketplace, um, this is real. You know, there was a point in the past <clears throat> where politicians could do dumb things and it didn't really matter. Think about it. Coming out of World War II, we were going to be the economic superpower. We were the most free country. Europe was devastated. Japan was devastated. We were going we to emerge as the greatest economic power in history, and we are. But today, with the competition we're now seeing from India and China, we have 304 million people in this country. China has 1 billion 300 million people in their country. They've got a billion more people. Their economy is, you know, it's growing. Now, Obviously, right now with this recession, all economies are depressed and, 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 and we're in recession. But India has 800 million people. I mean, those, those economies, those big countries, the competition is now stiffer. For, we're at the point in history where it's, it's incumbent upon the politicians to do it right for a change, to keep taxes low, get spending under control, and as I said, have an energy policy that has some common sense to it. So it's real important we understand what we're, what we're dealing with in an economic context and, and embrace those policies that have always worked. When you have low taxes, when you empower entrepreneurs and, and small business owners and families to go after their goals and dreams, pursue those things that have real meaning to them, good things happen. We saw it with Reagan. We've seen it whenever it's been tried. And then the third one, and, and again, I've touched on this already, is this values debate that's going on in our culture. There is a debate over whose set of principles are going to win. And it's important that we never shy away from standing up and saying, you know what? There are certain fundamental principles that made us great in the first place, and we're going to defend them. And it's, and it's, prote it's protecting human life. It's, it's understanding the importance of family, that key institution in our culture, which in my judgment ultimately determines the strength of the entire society and how policies can protect. It's, it's recognizing that faith in the public square has always been a part of the American experience, and we should continue that. But it's also respect for the free market, respect for the work ethic, respect for those fundamental principles that make us great. And we should never back away from defending it, even though we know the press will never give us a fair shake. I mean, Morton brought up the Washington. We get the Washington Times in our office each morning, too. Uh, it's one of those papers that actually pretty objective and pretty fair. Cal Thomas had a great line when he was talking about the, the, the national press, the elite, you know, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the elite national press on the coast, and how it's, it's, uh, there's a big difference between the way they think and the way normal people think. And he had, a, he had a great line. He said, uh, I get up every morning, I read my Bible in the New York Times so I can see what each side's up to. And, <laughs> and there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, a lot of truth to that. So always remember, we're never going to get a fair shake. Just know the score before you start. We're always going to be ridiculed. Jordan's always that right-wing crazy guy who's fighting for balanced budgets and lower taxes and defending human life. That's fine. That's part of the challenge. That's one of the reasons I left coaching wrestling, which I like doing. It was fun to help student athletes try to get to their goals on the wrestling mat. But I love the fight of this, where you know the principles you believe in are the principles that matter for this country, and you get a chance to go debate and fight for them every single day. And it's a lot of fun. 
And so I want to thank you for doing that same thing, for standing up and saying, you know what, these principles are important, not just in the United States, but all over the world. And it's important that we defend it. And the United States has to lead. The world is a safer and better place when the United States leads. Again, the only folks who don't understand that is the editorial page of the New York Times. Most Americans get that instinctively, and it's important we do that. I'll finish with this. How many of you ever seen the, uh, seen the movie Chariots of Fire? Anyone watched it? If you haven't watched it recently, watch it. It's a great show. Um, for those of you who haven't seen it, the storyline is we follow a handful of British athletes in the early 1920s as they're preparing to compete in the 1924 Paris Olympic Games in the sport of track and field. And you really focus in on two in particular, Eric Little and Harold Abrahams. Both gifted athletes, both wind up being Olympic champions. Uh, Abrahams in the 100 meter dash, Eric Little in the 400 meter dash. The most compelling scene in my judgment took place prior to the Olympic Games. They're both college age athletes. Abrahams is from England, uh, Little's from up in Scotland. Both had, both sprinters of course, both had never lost a race, undefeated, <coughs> winning all the races. And so being athletes, being competitors, they just had to know if the two of us race, who's going to win? Who's the fastest guy? And uh, so there was a competition put together. They invited the fastest guys from all over, uh, all over um, Europe. Came time for the meet. Stadium was full. I mean, this was the event to be at that day. This is like the final four coming up. This is the sporting event to be at that day. And so it uh, came time for the 100 meter dash. They lined them up, fired the gun, had the race, and it was Eric Little first, Harold Abrahams second. Track meets over. Harold Abrahams is now sitting up in the empty stand. There's a young lady <coughs> sitting beside him, a lady that he would later marry. And, and Harold Abrahams <coughs> is, is, is looking down at the empty track, and he is replaying this race in his mind over and over again. And every time, it's the same result. It's Little first and him second. Little first, Abraham second. And it is driving him nuts because he's never lost. And he's going through this and he, he hates it. I mean, being a competitor, he hates losing. He's going through this exercise. The young lady turns to him and she knows what's going on, but she asks a rhetorical question. She, she says, Harold, what's the problem? So you lost. You finished second. You know, second's nothing to frown about. You've won all the others. Why the long face? And he turned back to her and he said, I don't run to lose. I run to win. And if I can't win, I won't run. He's basically saying, I'm going to quit. I can't, take the, I can't take what's associated with losing. I can't take the, the, the risk of doing this work and then actually falling short. It's just too tough. I don't want to deal with it. He was going to quit. There was a pause, and she turned back to him and said, the best line of the whole show, the line that's all about this country. She turned back to him and she said, Harold, if you don't run, you can't win. And it's so, if you never are willing to risk it, if you're never willing to make that full commitment and step in the game, you can never accomplish anything of meaning or significance. And Americans have always been willing to get off the sideline, to get in the game, because that's where things happen. And that's what you all are doing. You're getting in the game. You're helping folks like me who are in the public policy arena. But this is about all Americans stepping in the game and saying, you know what, we're going to continue to have America be the greatest nation in history, protect those freedoms, those liberties that make us special in the first place. And so for that, I want to thank you. And I'll be happy to take your questions if you have any. Is that appropriate? Is that, is that what you normally do here? Oh, I, absolutely okay. right. You all pay my, I tell this every audience, you all pay my salary, so you're allowed to ask any question you want. You're allowed to yell at me. I think this gentleman was first, and then the lady in the back, and so we'll go here first. Right here, Howard. Yeah, like the mic. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know that. Yeah, is that working yet? Uh, hello? Yeah. In 1965, we allowed 250,000 immigrants into the country every year. And then uh, Kennedy and some others changed it to today about a million one will come in legally, another million illegally. And we're on track to make uh, another hundred million yeah. in the next uh, 30 years, which I don't see any advantage to native born Americans. As you've talked about the six major questions on, on your plate today, immigration is always going to be talked about in terms of illegal immigration, amnesty, etc. Mm -hmm. Is there any chance that the Congress would take a second look as we're shedding 600,000 jobs a month to say legal immigration should be cut back to historical levels of say a quarter million, et cetera. Would this be a possibility? Not this Congress. 
No, not this Congress, but you, you make a, 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 a great point. Look, next uh, Monday, this will be the third one I've done back in, in, in the 4th District in Ohio, be at the University of Findlay uh, doing a naturalization ceremony. And if you get it, I would encourage you, ever get a chance to go to one of these, it, it's amazing. The last one of that, 36 new Americans stand up there, take the oath, and the smile on their face when they finish that oath and they realize Judge Zuhari, a federal judge, I, I'm going to have lunch, it does a great job with these things. I give a little talk to them and they, the smile on their face when they realize they are now a citizen of the greatest nation in history, it's amazing. And it's, trust me, it's the rainbow. You see every, from every corner, every color, every, it's a wonderful thing. But they did it legally. And that's the point. And what I tell everyone is, if we don't enforce our laws, we diminish what those 36 people went through. And the, I assume it'll be 30 some more next, next Monday. And these are special things to be a part of. It's always, if you follow the right principles, you always arrive at the right policy. It's one of the things we believe in. And the principles are, respect the rule of law, you can't have amnesty. Make the system work better for those who want to come here for the right reasons, who want to learn our language and be a part of our common culture. And frankly, part of it is, part of, part of the principle I think is, you have to enforce the law on the board. You have to build the fence. I've taken, I've taken, you know, some of my colleagues like to take these Codels, these trips to the Bahamas and to Europe. And I've been on three. I've been to Anwar in Alaska. Uh, to see where we need to be drilling. Um, I've been to the Arizona-Mexico border and I've been to Iraq. So not exactly Paris, any of those three. But um, when you go down the border, you, you will find out the fence works. And the fence works um, and it's one of the things we have to do. So you, you follow the right principle or you have the right principles, you will arrive at the right policy. And you will have a policy that I think recognizes people want to come here because they value what, what we all value in this country. They want the same thing for their kids and grandkids that we want for ours.